hear me. Yeah, that's a question. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for the thumbs up, Ken. Counting on you. Um, hi, everybody. Over COVID distance. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Gossels, the new artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. And I just want to start by taking in this beautiful moment. This beautiful moment of um, having seen a film that's spectacular and powerful and cinematic and truly meant for a big screen. Of being together as a community and as an organization in conversation in a movie theater. This is the third time I've seen the film, and there's nothing like seeing the film on a big screen with an audience like all of you. Um, I'm also so excited to be in conversation with our two distinguished guests, whom I'm about to introduce, and for the Q&A we'll all have together. So, Miriam May is the CEO of the Friends of the Aravai Institute. Their mission is to support the critical work of the Aravai Institute for Environmental Studies through public awareness, student recruitment, and fundraising campaigns. Before joining the Aravat Institute, Miriam worked at Harvard as Hillel Outreach Director and Managing Director of the Harvard University's Advanced Leadership Program. Dr. David Lehrer served until last August and for 20 years as, as Executive Director of the Aravat Institute for Environmental Studies. He's currently Aravat's Director of International Development. David has been a member of Kibbutz Keturah, uh, the home of the Aravai Institute since 1981. And lucky for us, he's here on sabbatical this year, lecturing at his alma mater, one of his two alma maters, at Boston University. So welcome, Miriam and David. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having us. We're so excited. So um, before we get into our conversation, which we're also looking forward to, I wanted to just share a few of my reflections on the film which will surely inspire your reflections, and we will go on from there. Um, so I'm so happy that Joey Katz, our director of special programming, chose this film as our opening night program. For me, this film operates on so many levels as a personal, political, and environmental journey. Um, what I appreciate about this film so much is that it operated on so many levels. I love how complex and nuanced and multi-layered the narrative was. I really appreciated how deeply humanizing the film is. I appreciated the histories and perspectives the filmmakers chose to represent. And that everyone is given a chance to speak their truths. And the respect according to everyone we meet in the movie, it's just so important. For me, Oded and Youssef and Munkef they're really paragons for me, portraits of dedication and perseverance and courage. And how their brotherhood was forged during this 18-month environmental action is just so powerful, this action to swim to save the Dead Sea. And what makes their stories so compelling and emotional and real is how we come to know them, right? And their families and everything that's important in their lives and the obstacles they share. And what binds them, these amazing men, this brotherhood that is forged, right, is um, based on what we so desperately need in this fractured world, mutual respect and trust and understanding. And a commitment to caring for our land, our air, our trees, our water, our food supplies, precious natural resources, and our ecosystems. I think filmmakers Ido Glass and Yoav Kleinman did a beautiful job of educating and entertaining us and inspiring us all to be Dead Sea Guardians. And the way I see this film, and I can't wait to hear more from you, it feels in a way like a prayer, a prayer and a, and a film about what is possible. And it's also very realistic. So there we have it. Those are very first thoughts. Um, may I ask for yours? So one of the things I found truly that resonated very much for the film is this idea of complexity. Um, David and I work with in uh, with Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians all the time. The Arava Institute has welcomed students, one third Israeli Jews, one third um, Arab speakers, whether they're from Jordan, the West Bank, or Israel, or beyond, and one third international students for 25 years. And um, 
Our Arab students are our bravest students because they really face personal and familial risk. You saw that in Munkath's case. Exactly. Where he really felt it from his family, felt it from his community, and people really did not support him. And the community did not support him. And so they are our bravest students. But everything we do, and uh, whether it's uh, academically, research, et cetera, um, is underlayered by the complexity. Now, what, what we do is, is environmental peace building, both on two levels, both in terms of um, educating our students and building what you mentioned, trust. That is the most rare thing in the Middle East and really something we've spent 25 years building. We have 1,500 alumni out in the world who've learned that lesson through us and have learned to speak to, with each other respectfully, who've lived in dorms together and eaten their meals together and done their laundry together. And there's one, you know, Kibbutz Kitura, is, if those of you who have a sense of the geography, is about 30 minutes north of a lot. And it's, I would like to say it's at the end of the earth and then you make a right turn. <laughs> it's sort of in the middle of nowhere and it really encourages the students to, um, live as a family, to know each other, and um, they take that out into the world, and they take that out both to their home communities and to their families. And it's very important multiplier of what we do uh, at Kibbutz Keturah, and their environmental education is a key part of that. Thank you, Miriam. I, I um, so much identify with what you said. Um, and, it, and, and much of the film really uh, resonates with me on a very personal level because, um, first of all, uh, um, Munkit, uh, Gidon Bromberg from EcoPeace and Nada are all uh, colleagues of mine and we, we work together on different uh, levels. I don't know Ido and I don't know uh, Yusuf. Uh, I now look forward to meeting them. You'll meet them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so much of what they went through, um, the, the um, heartache and the challenges that they face, that we all face in the region, um, uh, the Aravai Institute is uh, um, committed to advancing cross-border environmental cooperation in the face of political conflict, and you saw it there. Um, uh, at the Aravai Institute, we believe that the environment uh, can't wait for peace between Israel and Palestine. Um, and we believe that by working together, as was really beautifully demonstrated in this film, um, we can build those bridges of trust that we saw at the end of the, of the film. Um, and, and I do believe that, I do believe that um, uh, what we do every day um, is to build uh, trust, is to build a relationship, and to build the potential, to build the possibility for, uh, for a peace. And I think that this movie, one of the beautiful things about the movie, aside from its beautiful cinematography and, and the incredible human stories that we saw, um, I, I, I think that it, it you know, gives you a little bit of a light into what really is happening in many places in our region, uh, often on a daily basis. There are many, many people um, in the region working on environmental issues, working on water, working on energy together, because that's the only way we can, we can uh, deal with these issues, the only way we can deal with climate change. You know, you just made me think about this, David. When we think about the news, what we see in the news media, we do not hear enough stories about like this, do we? Would anybody not agree with me? We need to hear more stories like this because you're feeling it on a daily basis. And I know that you have students and alumni that you're so proud of. And you're doing work in universities here. Or are there students here going to the kibbutz? Can you tell so, us a little bit more? Yes, yeah, so we recruit students in the United States and North America and around the world. And now we're getting students from Morocco. And we're hoping to get students from UAE and other places that are coming to the Aravat Institute, whether for a semester or a year, or some of them stay longer. Um, actually, one of the kind of amazing stories was I sat down for a meal at, um, at Kibbutz Kiturao. I was there on a visit. And a young man sat across from me, and he said, he's, he was Jordanian, and a Jordanian Christian. And he said to me, you know, I'm thinking of staying in this country. Rarely am I, spend, huh. am I rendered speechless, but this was a moment. And I said, give me, give me a minute here. And I said, ah, 
before you make that decision, leave this kibbutz. Leave the Arab Institute. Because we do create a bubble, and a bubble of understanding and, and ability to speak to each other. And we do something called the Peace Building and Leadership Seminar, where our students, our, our American students, our Israeli students, our Arab-speaking students, all sit together and speak about truth. We call that a safe place, where they can say anything to each other. And they do. Yeah, um, I just want to say one thing more about the film as it relates to our situation in the region. Um, and that is that this, look, I don't think that Munkip and, and Oded and, and Yusuf really believed that they were going to save the Dead Sea by swimming across it. I think they understood, as we all understand, that it was a symbolic gesture about a very big issue which goes way beyond the Dead Sea. And the, the issue is uh, water. The issue is that there's just not enough water in our region. Jordan is one of the most water-stressed countries in the world. The Palestinians have about a third of uh, the water per capita that the World Health Organization recommends. Um, in Gaza, uh, um, Water, 95% of the water is undrinkable. Um, so water is a big issue for everyone. Israel, through its technological, technological prowess, has managed to literally uh, solve its water stress problems. Israel is also a water stressed country that is, um, uh, that is uh, suffering from drought, as are all the countries in the region, but through technology has managed to um, create a water surplus. So what was even mentioned here, and, and that is the truth, is that today Israel has a surplus of water. Israel has surplus capacity to create more water than it actually needs. And this creates a phenomenal opportunity for the region as a whole to work together. It really means that there may be many things that we continue to uh, um, disagree about, that we continue to have a conflict over, but water does not have to be one of them. So what is your solution? <laughs> what does Israel do with that excess water? Hmm? Right, well, yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. People maybe know, even know there was a, um, an academic uh, here in this area at MIT, Frank Fisher. I don't know if anybody here knows him. Uh, Professor Frank Fisher, who was really a mentor of mine. Um, and he uh, would relate to, um, back to the Bible, the story of Abraham, and how, um, you know, uh, how the well that, uh, that is the well of Beersheba was um, a, a well that became a place for people to uh, build trust and to share those water resources. And he was, uh, um, he really uh, created a whole uh, uh, theory about how Israel, Jordan, Palestine could all share um, our water resources. I want to say also that um, at the Aravai Institute, we've taken that to heart. Um, we uh, strongly believe working through our Center for Transboundary Water Management and through other programs and partnerships with Palestinians work to make sure that there's enough water for everybody in the region, that their water is clean and drinkable, and that there's enough water for, uh, for nature. I want to give one example of something that we've done uh, very recently. Um, working with our Palestinian partners, um, we've helped to bring into Gaza um, three uh, atmospheric water generators. This is a technology that was developed in Israel that takes water out of the atmosphere and turns it into drinking water. And um, over the past two years, even during the pandemic, we've worked with our Palestinian partners in Ramallah and in Gaza and with the Israeli government officials to get that technology to hospitals and municipalities um, in, in uh, Gaza. Even during the most recent conflict between Israel and Gaza, that water was utilized and provides uh, needed water for people uh, who were suffering from a lack, of it, a lack of drinking water. And because the technology was so successful, 
when the war was over, when the fighting stopped, um, we received more requests from Gaza municipalities to help to get more technology in. So I think that what we see is there is a real opportunity around water, okay, around our most basic needs um, uh, to partner, to work together, to build trust, and to create a different reality. And I, I want to say about those water projects, we have five more waiting to go in. We're blessed that our um, American supporters uh, have uh, chosen to invest in this, that the IDF and the civil authority has allowed this to go forward, that they know exactly where these systems are for the next conflict, so that they survive the conflict, uh, that they're powered by solar power, which we also have, and that we have been able to bring uh, 20 Gazans in two drips with the permission of the Israeli Defense Forces into Israel to train in these systems so that they will own them. It's not that they need us, that they become independent in providing their own water. And uh, for many of them, this was their first trip out of Gaza. This was the first time they saw a mountain. This was, they could not believe how welcoming their, is, uh, their Israeli hosts at the Arava Institute were. This was not what they had heard. And so it was a real moment, um, both for this small group to learn the technology, but also to experience each other. More people need to know about your work. And I know you're very, you, you have a lot of friends here and around the world and in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, but this is so important that we keep hearing these stories. Tell us about the students you work with, or you know, some of your favorite projects, or some of the graduates you're most proud of. You know, are there examples? I mean, I think our graduates, you know, it, they they tell the best stories. You know, it's when when the, my, one of my favorite stories is about a kid who came from uh, Palestine, and when he you know got to um, Keturah, he had a nice Jewish roommate. And he said, you know, one of my dreams is to go to El Aqsa. And the guy said, okay, I'll rent a car, we'll go. So a couple days later, he, he and another kid jump in the car, they go down to Jerusalem, they go to El Aqsa. And afterwards, he calls his mother and says, guess what I got to do, Mom? I got to go to El Aqsa. He said, how did you get there? She said, oh, this Israeli rented a car, I got in the car, we went. You got in a car with an Israeli? Are you out of your mind? And that reminds us that we see it from one point of view. We see it from our side, and they see it from their side in exactly mirror image. And it's really important, um, you know, and, and what are our students doing? Uh, you know, uh, David can tell you more about our students in the Middle East who have established companies and who are working in the field and have PhDs in, our, uh, in Oxford and in Canada and also our American students who are uh, uh, working for the AG's Office on Environmental Protection in, Cal in California and uh, go on to Fulbright's and all the kinds of things you expect. Our students are very varied in where they come from and, and their backgrounds, but they really take this message with them and form a network. I'm always amused that you know they can couch surf each other in Berlin. Um, you know, they're everywhere. Um, a few years ago, I was invited to the, um, the Israeli parliament, to the Knesset, uh, to the Committee on, uh, on the Environment, the Environmental Committee, and they were having discussions about how to make Israel's food systems more sustainable. And uh, I was sitting on a panel with, three other, with two other people. Um, uh, one woman uh, who was uh, the head of the uh, research department of the um, of the Knesset. Uh, members of the parliament are able to ask uh, uh, the research department to do research, and she was asked to do a study on pesticide use in um, agriculture in Israel. She gave that report. I won't go into it because it wasn't very pretty, but uh, it, it was. Um, she gave a very good and thorough report about uh, the use of pesticides and what should be the policy, and then. Uh, the other woman was uh, from a non-governmental organization, the Heschel Center in, in Tel Aviv, and she was, spoke about um, how to make the, uh, um, the food system, the food uh, chain in uh, uh, supermarkets in Israel more sustainable. She'd done a project on it. And then they turned to me and they said, well, David, what does the Aravai Institute do for sustainability 
in Israel, and I said, well, the woman on my right and the woman on my left are both graduates of the RMI Institute. Wow. That's what we do. Awesome. Um, I have now one question for you, David, and one for Miriam, and then it's going to be up to you. We'll be in conversation together. Um, David, you've obviously been at Arva for over 20 years, and you've seen a lot of changes, a lot of changes. And I'm just curious if you want to comment on them, and also how having this environmental goal, when we talk about peacemaking and the environment, right, how those kind of have come together, and has there been a shift? For example, working towards an environmental goal, does that make it easier to work on peace building? So um, I'm really, first of all, I, I think it's really important to say that the Institute was founded in 1996, 25 years ago, this is our 25th uh, anniversary, and uh, was founded by two of my friends, uh, Professor Alon Tal and Miriam Sharton, who were members of the kibbutz at the time. Um, and I came actually five years after the institute was founded, but it was found, from the very beginning, it was founded uh, with the idea of bringing these two important issues together, peace and the environment. Um, and uh, I think that to a certain extent, that has been the uh, formula for our success. The formula for our success, the fact is, is that we have been through it all for 25 years, since 1996, during the you know, sort of um, halo days of the Oslo agreements, uh, through the uh, Second Intifada, through uh, the, the Second Lebanon War, through uh, multiple incursions into Gaza, through just a, a tremendous number of uh, um, upheavals, political and, and, and military, um, the Institute has, has remained, has grown, has become stronger. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're not simply bringing people together to talk about peace. Because a lot of times there is no peace. And if there is no peace, um, then it's really hard to have a conversation. But when you're talking about something that is critical for everybody, that is uh, of mutual concern for everybody, then people understand in the end that the needs, uh, the basic needs of humanity for clean water, clean air, uh, a, a, a home, healthy uh, environment um, transcends the political issues. We don't ignore the political issues, but we understand that at the same time that we work towards a political horizon, we also need to work towards an environmental horizon. So we've seen the RFI Institute grow, strengthen, become bigger, more students, more research, and more alumni. Awesome. You know, I said I was going to give them each one question. We're going to get one short last question, because I want people to hear this if anybody has to leave. And then I'm going to give you two questions, one's really short, OK? Um, so Miriam, the Dead Sea. We just saw a whole movie about it. What are you doing there? Because I know you're doing stuff, and I know you've been to the Dead Sea, and you've seen it from the Jordanian side, which we all saw in the movie. So you um, a comment on the Dead Sea? So uh, it's funny. One time, uh, not a few years ago, I was uh, driving from the kibbutz to Jerusalem with my, our, my colleague and uh, sometime faculty member, my, Rabbi Michael Cohen from Vermont, and kibbutz Kitura. He kind of goes back and forth. And we were driving, uh, uh, and I'm like looking at the Dead Sea, and it looks completely different than I remembered it uh, from my time as a student there, from my uh, sabbatical year there in, in the 90s. And I'm like, wow, this is so different. And he says, yes, we have figured out how to pollute together. Mm. Now we have to figure out if we can clean it up. And it stuck with me from that moment, because I hadn't seen these sinkholes. I hadn't seen the highway had to, which had to move and all the things. Uh, last time I had been in the Dead Sea, I had been in the water. Uh, then on our Beyond Borders trip, which is a trip that's leaving this weekend, uh, where we go to Jordan, Israel, and Palestine, we take a tour. Oh Okay. Let us I have know. a job though that I love. <laughs> no, it's, it's not that long a tour. Um, and uh, we um, we had the privilege of having dinner at a home of um, a Jordanian woman who works extensively with Israel. Uh, a really nice home, um, but overlooks the Dead Sea from the other area. And I remember standing with you, David, and you say, 
and that's Jordan, and that's Jerusalem, and that's Ramallah, and that's this, and that's, I mean, you can see, they got the view, folks. They can see everything. And it is shocking how close these things are. There's 20 minutes of good road between Ramallah and Jerusalem. Someone just has to be willing to travel it. And we are. Thank you. David, tell people about quickly um, the dialogue project and your event on March 31st. Right. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, the Friends of the Aravai Institute has done for a number of years um, has been to bring uh, some of our alumni, those students who, who went through the program, Palestinian, Israeli, Jordanian, to the United States um, to visit uh, campuses and visit communities around uh, the country um, in order to tell the story, in order for, to hear firsthand what it's like to be uh, an alum, to be a student at the Aravai Institute, to hear the stories firsthand. Um, and uh, um, a, as you would expect over the past two years, uh, those um, uh, programs have been virtual uh, because we have, no one's been able to travel. Now we're, we're able to get together a little bit more, but we're still not quite there yet. So um, uh, together with Boston University um, and the, uh, and the uh, Friends of the Arba Institute, we've arranged to have two of our alumni speaking to us on Zoom, but there will be a live audience. Uh, and so it, there'll be some live interaction. And this is going to take place next uh, Thursday at 2.30 at the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies at Boston University. You will, you are, if you're interested, you're invited to come in person, but if you want to join by Zoom, you're also welcome to do so. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm gonna open up, even though we could keep talking for a long time. They will be around after this um, conversation. Um, Dave, and I don't know if Rachel's still here. Is Rachel here? Yeah. Oh, Rachel Calico. So after we're done, um, Rachel and David and Miriam will be very happy to talk to you in the lobby a little bit more about their work. Um, one question for all of you before we open this up. How many people in this audience have been to the Dead Sea? Wow, if you all look around, almost everybody. That's really astounding. Okay. Um, so this is time for questions for our wonderful guests. Ken Shulman. David, you, you illustrated how Israeli technology has been very effective, not only in bringing water to distressed areas, but also as making a bridge between conflicting parties. Have any of the countries surrounding Israel, both countries with whom Israel has peace treaties and countries that it doesn't, have they expressed interest in this technology? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Maybe rephrase the question a little, David, or include yeah, the question here. Yeah. So um, what I would say is this is certainly since the uh, Abraham Accords, uh, there has been a phenomenal amount of interest in uh, Israeli technology coming from uh, the Gulf countries. Um, uh, the Gulf countries face, face many of the challenges that Israel faces, and there's a lot of interest in, uh, in um, uh, Israeli technology, and, and, and there's business people going back and forth. There has also been some interest from other countries in the wider region. I won't mention any names, but there has been uh, contact um, with some other uh, um, Arab countries expressing interest in technology. Um, in terms of the immediate uh, region, uh, Jordan, Palestine, um, it, there is a lot of interest. My good friend, Shadad, Dr. Shadad Atili, uh, um, it, who was the former minister of water for the Palestinian Authority, likes to say, hey, we're against the occupation. We're not against Israeli technology. Um, so there is definitely interest, and there's a lot of work being done on that one. And I just want to add to that. One of the things about technology is you also have to con consider the socio and economic effects of that technology. You can't just like, dump technology and think it's going to take hold. For instance, Israel reuses 84% of its water for agriculture. Its gray water is overwhelming, and that makes it, the next country is Spain at 29%. It is not just a technological solution. It also has to be a social solution. 
people have to believe it's clean enough. They have to believe the food that comes out of it is edible. They have to be comfortable with those things. And so if you take on the technology without taking on the socioeconomic side of it, you um, are part of the way there. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think what you said before is that the Israelis have excess water, and we know that uh, the Israelis um, gave themselves the water sources on this side of the wall, and that the Palestinians didn't have water. Have the, is there anything with the Israelis sharing water with the Palestinians, and is there any opening up of water sources on the Palestinian side? The big problem in, on the Palestinian side is, um, is, is a lack of uh, infrastructure. There's a, there's a real serious problem with infrastructure. And to a certain extent, you, you can supply more water, but it won't get to the, to the people if you don't have the pipes, if you don't have the, um, the way to do that. Uh, and so that's really where the need is more than anything else in, I would say, in the West Bank and in Gaza is we need infrastructure, we need pipes, we need wastewater treatment systems, um, and that is hampered not simply by uh, a lack of uh, resources, but it's also, it is hampered by the current political situation uh, between Israel and the, and the Palestinians. Recently, um, Israel uh, just increased the amount of water that uh, it is giving to Jordan, it just re-signed an agreement uh, um, and, and increased that amount. Um, and I think that there is also the opportunity to do so with the Palestinians, um, but we need more than just water, we need an investment in infrastructure. And do the Israelis agree to the infrastructure so that the Palestinians can have water? That's the problem. The problem right now is there's still- Originally they didn't. Yeah, there's yeah. still a political, uh, um, it, 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 let's put it this way, it's the, the complicated stories around uh, developing the West Bank due to the current political system is really holding up a lot of that infrastructure. Yes, thank Nobody's you. How many uh, students or fellows do you have at any one time at the Institute and what do they do on a daily basis? Do they uh, participate in research, they write papers, or do they just study? So we have. Uh, Can you include the question? So um, the question was, how many students do we have, and and what do they do uh, <laughs> during during their day? So um, we are an academic research institute, so we have classes. There are about ten or twelve cl classes offered a semester, so they can take uh, both um, technological classes uh, in water, uh, hyperarid agriculture. Uh, et cetera, and so forth, and also on socioeconomic and political uh, issues around, but everything is through an environmental lens. Everything is uh, seen, you, you come into the Envi Arava Institute of Environmental Studies, not the Arava Institute of Peace Studies. However, uh, and David will talk about the origins of the Peace Building and Leadership Seminar, all our students attend that for three hours a week, whether they like to or not, and at the beginning they don't like to, and at the end they love it. But that's where they talk about the things they need to talk about. Um, we also have interns who are supporting research projects, who are working directly with faculty on research projects. We also have universities, uh, WPI from nearby Worcester, um, sends a group of students for four to six weeks every year to do intensive engineering studies and um, for credit. So these, and it, our program is accredited both by BGU and uh, by Bennington College uh, in order to give our uh, Arab students particularly um, US credit rather than BGU credit. So uh, David, do you want to talk about it? I yeah. think, yeah. I think what's gonna happen, um, thank you Miriam and David. I can't wait to talk to you more in the lobby um, this has been so wonderful. I just want to thank you all for coming. I want to let you know, we, you should tell your friends and families, and you can actually see this film again. Um, this film will be streaming. We have seven more amazing films um, available online. And we also have a closing night film that's going to be in person, Let It Be Morning, a beautiful um, fiction film. 
um and that's on wednesday, march thirtieth, the last day of our festival. so we hope you'll join us and tell your friends and family. and thank you for being here and get home safe. thank you. thank you for having us. and we hope joey gets better soon. we hope joey gets better soon.